Hello, and welcome to lecture 14 in our four weeks on water curriculum. Today we are going to do some review on data, data analysis, how you can display your results, and what to do if you didn't answer your research question but still found something interesting. Let's start with a quick review on data. First, I just want to go back to your research question. Since you've been exposed to many different ways to access data at this point, you should have your research question pretty well in hand. One quick reminder. Make sure your research question is not too broad. Remember, you want your question to be fairly specific so that once you answer it, you've accomplished something. An example of a question that would be too broad would be, what is the maximum daily temperature in the Androscoggin River in the summer of 2014? Although this may be an interesting piece of information, it doesn't really mean anything because it's too broad. Second, don't forget about the difference between big data and small data. Recall that small data can be a few hundred to a few thousand data points, whereas big data is several thousand to tens of thousands of data points. For small data sets, we can use Excel to process them and to create visuals, like a graph. For big data sets, however, we can use a code-based software like R to process that data set and to produce figures. When I showed you how to do this in a previous lecture, I provided you with a pre-written code that you can use for this curriculum. However, I wanted to mention that code writing is a skill on its own. The folks at Plymouth State University write many different codes to manipulate the Lovotex data sets in many different ways and to produce figures based on those data sets. Now let's talk about data analysis. I've shown you several ways to access data online and some ways to process that data through R and Excel. On the Four Weeks on Water website is a series of videos under the Videos and Quizzes section showing you other ways to use R, how to use Excel to produce descriptive statistics on a data set, and if you are interested in further statistical analysis, then your professor at your home institution can, can help you with that further. Next, let's talk about displaying your data. First, when you're figuring out ways to display your data, you have to make sure you are very clear with whatever methods you choose. For example, if you choose to use a graph to display your data, you need to make sure that the graph is a self-explanatory graph, meaning that if someone just was looking at the graph, they know exactly what they are looking at. They might not know why they are looking at it and how it fits into your bigger research question, but that but they know exactly what the graph represents. Let's go back to our average daily temperature example. Here is a simple graph that I created on Excel representing temperature. If you look at this graph, you can see that I have a title, I have a y-axis and an x-axis, and I have some data represented. But you might notice that things aren't too great with this graph. For example, the title, average temperature. If somebody were looking at this graph, they might ask themselves, the average temperature of what? And my y-axis, I have F. Well, what does F mean? Is F the beginning of an axis description? Does F represent degrees Fahrenheit? And you can see that I have date on my x-axis, but I don't have uh, an x-axis description. And we can see that the data is represented here, but it doesn't really mean anything because we don't know where the data is or any more information. Here is an example of that exact same data represented on a line graph. You can see that my title is much more descriptive. It's the average daily temperature in Emerson Brook, the Nash Stream Watershed, Coas County, New Hampshire. I know the stream that this temperature was taken in. I know the watershed that was taken in, and I know that it was in Coas County, New Hampshire that I'm not talking about someplace in, say, Texas or Northern California. My y-axis is properly labeled, saying this is temperature in degrees centigrade. That's important because if you don't tell your reader if it's degrees centigrade or degrees Fahrenheit, it might not make sense. And then although the, the x-axis is pretty self-explanatory, I've also put here that it's the date represented on this axis. And now somebody looking at this temperature profile might say, okay, I know that this is in a particular stream in a particular location. I know I'm looking at degrees centigrade instead of degrees Fahrenheit. And that might mean more once they realize the big picture of your research question. Here is yet another example of a graph that I've created on Excel. 
You can see I have a title, fairly descriptive, represents the minimum, maximum, and average daily temperature in Emerson Brook, 2011. I have my y-axis labeled as temperature in degrees centigrade, and I have my date labeled on the, on the x-axis. But when we look at the data, we can probably figure out there's three lines there, a green, a blue, and a red, and that maybe one of the three lines represents minimum, one represents maximum, and one represents average daily temperature. But we don't know which. This is another thing that you have to keep in mind when you're representing your data. Something like this needs also a legend. You can see this is the exact same graph, graph same title, same uh, axis description, same data, but on the right here, I have a description of what each different color line represents, which again helps whoever is looking at your data to understand what's being represented there. If you choose to represent your data using other figures or photos, make sure you include a descriptive caption so that the person looking at your website knows what the figures or photos represent. Also, if you include any figures, anything figure-like or photo-like that was created by someone else, for example, something you've used off the internet, you have to include a citation for those figures or photos to give credit to whoever created them. Now let's talk about what to do if you didn't find an answer to your research question. More specifically, let's talk about if you get an answer that you might not have been expecting. The first thing you need to do is tell us. You have to explain that on your website. When you are presenting the results on your website, make sure you include your research question and then explain why your results were different from what you might have been expecting. Now, let's talk about what to do if you didn't find an answer to your research question but found, found something else interesting. Tell us about that as well. It's okay if you don't find an answer, but don't take the low road and just tell us that you didn't find an answer. Explain what you did find, include why you think you didn't find an answer to your question, but then tell us what you did find and why it is interesting. And again, you need to include something for a visual. Again, one way you can approach this is to think of your reader, or in this case, the people working through your website, and make sure you are telling them a story of your research. Lay it all out in an easy to follow format, explain it using as much detail as you can, and make your results very clear so that the reader gets the picture. You almost can't use too much detail. And remember, have some fun with it. Be creative and make your website look nice. As you work through this project and begin constructing your website, make sure you refer back to the website assignment document on the Four Weeks on Water website. Check and double check that you have met all of the requirements for this assignment. This concludes this video lecture. Don't forget to log on to the Four Weeks on Water curriculum website and take the quiz associated with this lecture.